Hi there, this video is about electronic fuses. The seller, Alexandre Bayenov, I hope I pronounced that right, of the nicely named Oops Paradox GitHub channel offered me a few for review. The core of this e-fuse is the Texas Instruments chip TPS16413, which Alexandre has put on a small PCB that is specially targeted for use on breadboards. He also wrote a very comprehensive guide to the chip and his PCB that you can download freely from Alexandra's GitHub page. See the links in the description of this video. The PCB consists mainly of the eFuse chip and a few additional resistors and capacitors. But there are several locations prepared for you to add connections and components. This PCB needs some soldering before it can be used. At the very least, a 3-pin connector to the breadboard and resistor R1 which determines the current limit tipping the fuse. The pin headers are included with the e-fuse but the resistor is of course something you have to decide on and supply. The rear contains some information what the different connection points are and the formula that determines R1 to set the current limit. I was about to solder the pin header and resistor for R1 in when it occurred to me that for e-fuse experiments it would be nicer to be able to change values easier. I considered using a breadboard but it turns out that the other connections do not follow the standard breadboard spacing so no joy. Alexander's manual discusses the use of a small trim pot instead of a fixed R1 but does not recommend it because the selected resistance and therefore the current limit cannot be easily seen. You may end up with a fuse that was accidentally set to pass too much current damaging your circuit. You may think you could simply measure the resistance of the trim pot, but I found that measuring R1 in circuit is very tricky. Many multimeters I tried just show wrong values. Only my primer and fluke handhelds produced the correct results, but none of my bench meters. It probably relates to the ohms test voltage used by the meters, which should be as low as possible, but DC, because using the FNERSI LCR STR1 tweezers set to 0.3 volts at 1 kHz also produced wrong values. The TPS16413 chip belongs to a whole family of e-fuse devices, some limit power, some as this one limit current. Some automatically reset, while the 16413 does not. It latches the fault and to get going again you need to turn power off and on again. The operating voltage for current limiting fuses is 2.7 volts to 40 volts, but Alexandra's board is for maximum of 24 volts because of the current limit going through the fault LED that's showing you if the fuse has triggered. The e-fuse chip not only monitors the output current but also whether the input and output pins of the fuse itself are bridged, thus preventing it from doing its job. The chip could include over voltage protection but this is not implemented in the PCB because that would prevent universal use from 2.7 volts to 24 volts. The over current protection is implemented and fixed at 2 amps. You can change it by replacing a resistor on the PCB, but it's clearly not made to make that easy. On the other hand, the PCB supports adding additional capacitors for a longer blanking time for transient current. The chip is pretty complex. It includes thermal monitoring and if it gets too hot it will also shut down. There is also an output slew rate control for inrush current limiting. One limitation on the whole of the TPS1641 family of chips is that they cannot be used for negative voltages. This means for example in a system that has plus 5 and plus minus 15 volts rails, you can only protect the plus 5 and plus 15 volts with these e-fuses. Here is another section of the datasheet mainly to illustrate that the behavior of the e-fuse isn't as simple as you may expect. When I lim is exceeded, the chip limits the current to IOCP, the overcurrent protection value, for a duration of the blanking time IDLY. If during that time the current drops again below I lim, the fuse does not trigger. This behavior is to avoid triggering prematurely when capacitors charge up or motors start. The equations for calculating I lim, IOCP, and IDLY are shown here. The schematic of the e-fuse can be downloaded from Alexander's GitHub page. 
R1 is the resistor that defines the current limit I lim. For example, 100K will result in a theoretical I lim of 98.4 mA, assuming of course your 100K resistor is really 100K. The chip has an additional tolerance of 6%. To be clear, that doesn't mean the limit is changing during operation. It means that the actual trip value of I lim could be at least 6% or more off from your calculation, but whatever it is, it does not change until you change R1 to a different value. The range of R1 is from about 6.2K for 1.6 amps to 270K for 36 milliamps. While you must add an R1 to the PCB, adding a C1 is optional and I did not do it. The capacitor determines the blanking time from which the current limiting time and the total time to trip are determined. With C2 of 12 nanofar, the PCB provides a default which results in a blanking time of 6.5 milliseconds, a current limiting time of 13 milliseconds, resulting in a total trip time of 19.5 milliseconds. The over-voltage protection pin is connected to ground, which means this is turned off. The fault output is connected to an LED and also available. The enable shutdown input of the chip is accessible on the PCB. R3 is set to 8.2K, which results in an IOCP of 2.01 amps. On one of my fuses, I changed R3 to 120K. This reduces IOCP to 137 milliamps, but it's not an easy job. On the left is my somewhat botched job replacing the tiny 8.2K resistor with a 120K one. The right shows the default. I had to scrape the solder mask to be able to solder the 120K in because I normally don't use such tiny form factors. There is enough space here and maybe a revised board layout could make such changes easier. Here is my E-fuse with just R1 set to 100K, actually 98.83K which should be around 99 milliamps. C1 is not populated, but I did add pin headers for fault and enable because I want to experiment a bit with these. And here it is in action on a little test circuit. Basically all it does is protecting a red LED. The protected positive rail runs along the lower part of the breadboard, indicated by the yellow bridges. The ground rail runs along the upper part. For taking timing diagrams with the scope, I added a beefy MOSFET that will rather brutally short circuit the protected positive rail to ground as soon as the button is pressed. When that happens, the E-fuse is triggered, removing the power on the protected rail. The big red LED turns off and the fault LED on the E-fuse shows that the E-fuse is doing its job. It stays that way until you remove the power to reset the fuse. As soon as this is done, the protected positive power rail is working again. If we measure the current in the ground connection to the breadboard, we find it's around 12.8 milliamps, but it appears very unstable and jittery. In fact, switching the multimeter to show DC and AC components separately, it turns out there's a 3.8 milliamp AC ripple current on top of the DC current driving the big red LED. This is caused by the E-fuse checking periodically for an in-to-out short circuit. This is what happens if I cause an in-to-out short. Not much. The red fault light shows that the chip detected the problem, but since the short bypasses the fuse, it cannot do anything else. The idea here is that the fault pin would be connected to some monitoring circuit that now raises an alarm or triggers an upstream circuit breaker. We can see that the E-fuse turned the power off because when I remove the in-to-out short, the big red LED goes off. This means the power was only flowing through my short circuit and no longer through the E-fuse. Measuring the voltage between in and out pins shows the pulses are caused by this check. They appear rather randomly spaced and about 650 microseconds long. But not to worry, these fluctuations do not spill over into your circuit. If I measure the current on the output of the E-fuse, that is the current actually feeding the circuit, it's as steady as could be. It's also 2 milliamps less than what I measured on the ground connection because the current used by the E-fuse itself is now excluded. Using this way of measuring current, I added a rheostat set to 100 ohms as a load to the protected rail.
together with the red LED, the circuit now draws a current of 55 mA. With the multimeter set into record mode, I can increase the current slowly until the E-fuse triggers. The multimeter beeps whenever a change in value is detected. I can exceed 100 mA comfortably, but before reaching 120 mA, the E-fuse trips. The maximum current value recorded by the multimeter is 116 mA. The resistor was 98.83, which should have produced an eye limb of 99 mA. I did additional tests for fuses set with resistors as accurately as possible to provide an eye limb of 250 mA, 500 mA and 1 amp. The result shows that in all cases the actual trip value was higher and except for 250 mA, definitely by more than 6% of the datasheet. 10 to 12% seems more likely. This kind of resonates with the comments in the Texas Instruments Q&A board for the 1641 series of chips, where other folks have remarked similar observations on calculated versus actual values. 6% or 12% is not that big of an issue, but something to be aware of. If you need to play it safe, calculate R1 for a current value that is at least 15% less of the maximum your circuit can handle without releasing magic smoke. I am interested in some other scope measurements and I want to briefly explain the setup. We have the breadboard with a familiar E-fuse, red LED and MOSFET arrangement. Since all scope channels share the same ground, it's important to select the ground connection carefully. In this case, I set the ground from the power supply. I added a shunt resistor of 1 ohm to the ground connection to the breadboard. By connecting one scope probe to the other side of the shunt, the channel shows the voltage drop across the resistor, in other words, the current. If the scope sees 1 volt across the 1 ohm shunt resistor, it means a current of 1 amp flows. The other scope channel can be either connected to V out or V in. This is the 1 ohm resistor added to the ground connection and the scope connected to it. In this setup, the green trace is the current while the yellow trace is V out. When the short circuit button is pressed, the current briefly spikes to almost 2 amps or IOCP and the E-fuse is beginning to limit the current by reducing V out. The current drops then to about 500 milliamps. This is mainly caused by the drop in V out, which reduces the gate voltage of the MOSFET so the short circuit current is reduced. While less than IOCP, it's still more than I lim, and so after the blanking period of 6.5 milliseconds, the current is now limited to I lim for another 13 milliseconds, and finally the E fuse opens and turns the circuit off. When I turn the power off and then reapply it, the chip resets and 3 milliseconds later starts ramping up V out to limit the inrush current. There is a potential trap that caused me diving into all kinds of rabbit holes until a discussion with Alexandre got me on the right path. I found that sometimes the E-fuse did not fully trigger. With that I mean the big red LED stayed on while at the same time the fault LED on the fuse was dimly lit. On checking with the scope, it reveals that the E-fuse was sort of oscillating. What the hell was going on here? Monitoring V in instead of V out revealed that over the course of dealing with a short circuit, the V in voltage dropped below 2.7 volts, the minimum operating voltage for the chip, which then resets. V in recovers and the current is ramped up again and as the button is still pressed, as soon as the MOSFET can conduct, the fuse is triggered again and the whole cycle repeats. This problem was caused by setting the current limit on my bench power supply that was too close to the short circuit draw, which caused the bench power supply to go into constant current mode instead of constant voltage. The lesson here is that one needs to consider the incoming power supply characteristics to make sure the E-fuse can do its job. So far we have just dealt with one E-fuse on one power rail. What if your circuit has multiple power rails? Here I have a duplicate of my circuit. The only difference is that the lower board has a green LED and is targeted to run at 15 volts instead of 5 volts for the red LED board. We also assume that the two circuits share the same ground connection. Other than that there is no connection and so the two circuits work quite independently.
a short circuit on one of the boards triggers the e-fuse but does nothing on the other which keeps working. That may just be what you want, but let's assume you would rather have the power gone from both circuits if one fails. As a first attempt to solve this problem, I simply connected the fault output of one e-fuse with the enabled shutdown input of the other and of course doing the same in reverse. Does this work? If I cause a short on the green LED circuit, its e-fuse triggers and forces a shutdown of the fuse for the other circuit. And the same happens after reset when I do the same on the red LED circuit. So, problem solved? Not quite, I was cheating and both circuits were actually running at 5 volts from independent power supplies but at the same voltage setting. You may have noticed that the green LED was dimmer than before. Watch what happens when I increase the supply voltage for the green LED circuit. As soon as I exceed 8 volts, the red fault light comes on, although the circuit keeps working. And triggering a short on the green LED circuit triggers both e-fuses. To understand what's going on and how to fix it, a quick look again at the schematic and the internals of the fault output and the enable input of the TPS1641 type of chips. First, notice that the enable input is pulled up, but that pull up comes from a V-int, a regulated power supply internal to the chip. With supply voltages 5 volts or more, I measure the voltage on the enable pin to be constant 5 volts. If you consider the e-fuse in a schematic being for the green LED, V1 is 15 volts, but fault is connected to the other 5 volt e-fuse and therefore on 5 volts. That is 10 volts minus the forward voltage of the fault LED, say 2 volts, so about 8 volt difference, and means we now have a current going from VE through the fault LED and the 22K resistor to the enable pin of the other E-fuse. It's only about 0.4 milliamps and probably does no harm, but it's confusing that the fault LED is on when there is no fault. If you put a diode, like a simple 1N4148, into the connection, it should prevent the excess current flow from the fault pin of the E-fuse running at higher voltage to the enable pin of the lower voltage E-fuse. Yet, the diode still allows triggering of the enable, or rather shutdown, when the fault pin is pulled down. I put the extra diode in. A wire runs from the enable pin to the anode of the diode and from the cathode onwards to the fault pin of the green LED circuit. That does the trick. The fault light stays off even though the green LED circuit is running at 15 volts voltage and when causing a short circuit, both circuits are turned off as before. To combine more than two e-fuses to act together needs more than a simple diode and I have not explored this further. E-fuses are quite a bit more complex than I assumed and a useful addition to breadboard circuits, especially if you use powerful batteries. Normally I have an inline fuse just in case. Let's remove that fuse and replace it with a wire, so if anything goes wrong now there will be definitely lots of magic smoke. Let's cause a short. The e-fuse saved the day much quicker than a PTC would have been able to limit the current and no need to replace a melted fuse either. If you want an e-fuse, there's a link in the description on this video where to get them and for Alexander's guide on configuring them for your needs. If you enjoy my videos, don't forget to like and subscribe. There are many more projects, repairs and reviews coming up. And it would be great if you decided supporting this channel by becoming a Patreon. Thanks for watching.